Hi, it's Kate, and this is the first video for week one of Math 23B. Now, last semester, we spent a lot of time talking about linear algebra, real analysis, properties of differentiation, determinants, and a little bit about manifolds. And now, starting off the second half of the school year, we're really going to be focusing on the story behind integration. So let's just take two seconds and remind ourselves of what you know or perhaps want to brush up on coming out of your typical univariate calculus class. Well, the first thing is, is that our functions generally map from R to R, as in our domain is R and our image is also R. You plug in a real number for X and you get out a real number for Y. And so the graph of that function, the set of points that obeys the particular rule that the function describes, lives in R2, where you have an X component and a Y component, and maybe looks something like this. Generally, when we're introduced to integration, I don't know about you, but a common practice in the classroom is to start off by finding a way to approximate the area under the curve. Let's give ourselves an interval from A to B. And usually we begin by taking this interval and slicing it up into smaller and smaller subintervals and using some sort of approximation method to determine the area of each individual slice. These are not exactly drawn to scale. They should be all the same with delta x. This should be ringing a lot of bells in your memory. And we learned a lot of different approximating methods. There was the left-hand approximating method. There was the right-hand approximating method. There was the trapezoidal method. There was the midpoint method. And the whole idea was, was that regardless of what you chose to be the rule that assigned a certain height to each of these triangles, whether you chose the left hand, the right hand, I'll draw in the left hand here, that if this function was integrable, as you sliced finer and finer and finer, all of these approximating methods would become more and more exact. And in fact, it didn't really matter which function value along your interval you chose, just as long as you chose some function value between your sub, on your subintervals. But the idea was that as you slice these subintervals finer and finer and finer, each of these approximating methods would become more and more accurate, and they would all converge to the actual value of this integral or the exact area under the curve. And so that's what we're going to start off with in Math 23b. Now, the issue is sort of that when you start going into higher and higher dimensions, we're no longer dealing with a graph that's in R2. If we just change to using a function that maps from R2 to R, as in it has an ordered pair that you input and then has just a single real number output, that means that its graph is going to be in R3. It's the set of points x, y, z, or x1, x2, x3, however you want to name those coordinates that obey the relationship that our function describes, and maybe it looks something like this. This looks a little bit like an Aladdin magic carpet, but it's just meant to be uh, a, the graph of a function in R3. So I put in an ordered pair of x and y, let me label my axes, and I get a z component out, and so this is the set of all points x, y, z that satisfy the particular relationship given by our function. So now the issue is that if I were trying to find, rather than the area under the curve, I'm now trying to find the volume under the surface, it's a little bit difficult to look at this domain and talk about right-hand endpoints or left-hand endpoints, but the domain, rather than be a particular interval along the real number line, is now going to be a region in the plane. I've started with a really simplified rectangular region. We're going to be integrating over more complicated regions later in the course, but this is just to give your mind an example to work through. And so you already realize that the notion of a right-hand approximating method, which was so useful when we were dealing with creating these rectangles, loses significance here because there is no like right-hand side of this or right-hand most point of this region. And then not only that, we have to deal with, well, there's no trapezoid method, there's no sort of like, I guess you could talk about a midpoint method. So we have to sort of find a consistent approach that doesn't become difficult as we go into higher and higher dimensions. And so when we're dealing with Riemann integrals in Rn, not just R3, but just in general, 
anything as simple as an interval along the real number line versus a region in the plane or a volume in space, we now will be using lower Riemann sums and upper Riemann sums. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be sort of following the general framework left here, but in a much more formalized and consistent approach. There's a slight difference between slicing into subintervals and what's known as dyadic cubes, which we're going to get to in a moment. But the idea is we're going to slice up our region and we're going to look at the minimum that the function achieves over each subinterval and use that as the function value that we evaluate over the subinterval. We're going to look at the maximum that each function achieves over the subinterval. We're going to use that as the approximating method. And so that's what contributes to the lower Riemann sum and the upper Riemann sum. The lower Riemann sums use the infimum of the function over that particular subinterval. The upper Riemann sums use the supremum of the function over that subinterval. And so because we learned when we first were introduced to these approximating methods, it doesn't matter what rule you're using, you just need to use a function value that's on the subinterval. All of these, no matter what you're using, left hand, right hand, upper, lower, trapezoid, midpoint, they're all, if you have an integrable function, they will all converge as the number of subintervals goes to infinity. So we will be using lower Riemann sums and upper Riemann sums. So the first thing that we need to do here is talk about how we're going to use this approximation method. Before, when we were in a univariate calculus class, our subintervals depended on our original interval, our interval from A to B. Usually what happens is you're given a problem that says approximate the value of this integral using four approximating points or three approximating points. And so you take the total length of this interval and you divide it by four or you divide it by three. And that's going to give you the width of each subinterval. Now we're going to throw that out the window. We're going to come up with a standardized approach that works regardless of the length of the interval. Note that if you were approximating the area under the curve using two subintervals, the length of those subintervals depends on the length of the total interval. We're going to get rid of that notion. We're going to create subintervals that are the same no matter what your interval length is. And so the idea here is what we're going to do is we're going to enclose our region of integration in a set of cubes whose endpoints are integers. So let's take a look. Here's our example in R2 where here's our interval in terms of x goes from a1 to b1, here's our interval in terms of y goes from a2 to b2, and a really oversimplified version of that, say we're just dealing with r. We're looking at the interval from a to b on the real number line. And what we're gonna do is we're first going to cover or enclose this region, this is our a, with cubes. Now they're not going to look like three-dimensional cubes like you know, Note that in this univariate setting, a cube is just an interval. In this setting, a cube is a square. And when your domain is actually R3, that's when your cube is a physical three-dimensional cube. And once you move beyond that, you stop being able to picture them. But when we define, when we say cube, we mean cube, same way we mean K parallelogram. So we want to cover our interval A in a set of cubes whose endpoints are integers. Well, first we need to find an integer value that's below A and an integer value that's above B in all scenarios. So let's do just the first example, the univariate example first. Maybe that interval looks something like this. And there very well may be additional integers throughout the interior of A that are between these integer endpoints that totally enclose A. Similarly, that square region, now when we're dealing with a domain in R2, perhaps we have a different, more complicated example over here, may look something like this. That's the integer that's below A1 and above B1, below A2 and above B2, so that these integer bounds totally cover A. And perhaps there are integers uh, between these integer bounds as well, so we can split it up accordingly. So note that we've now covered our interval, whether we're dealing in the univariate or multivariate setting, with little cubes that are length one. In this case, we have cubes that are length one along the interval. Here we have squares where each side length is one. 
but that's what we want to do when we enclose the region of integration in a set of cubes whose endpoints are integers. Then we're going to break up each edge of each cube into 2 to the n equal pieces, and this n is very important here. Just like when we were dealing with our analysis chapter, that big N means index, and this is the same idea here, that big N is basically the level of dyadic division. It's how fine we are slicing up these subintervals. So note that if we go with level zero, two to the zero is gonna be one. So that means that each of these blue squares over here, each of these blue intervals will be split up into one subinterval, which means there is actually no further splitting going on at all. If we took the level of dyadic division n equals one, that means we would split up each edge of each cube into two to the one or two equal pieces, and that would look something like this. I've done that in both situations. Here's these light blue marks are where we split up each cube into two dyadic cubes. And then here, note that we've taken what used to be four cubes, and since we've split up each edge into two separate cubes, each cube has become four dyadic cubes. So note that here when we say we break up each edge of each cube into two to the n equal pieces, thereby dividing each cube in two to the n to the n dyadic cubes, but big N is the index level and little n is the dimension of the space of the domain. So these two n's are different, hence one is uppercase, one is lowercase. So what ends up happening here is Again, we've already discussed this. For n equals 3, they're actual physical three-dimensional cubes. For n equals 2, they're squares. For n equals 1, they're line segments. But what happens is these are going to be our subintervals that we are taking the upper and lower Riemann sums over. So when we have u sub big N, that means the upper Riemann sum over the level of dyadic division big N. Note that we have one slight typo here. Uh, that should be a big N. It will be fixed in the notes that are posted to the course website. I will fix it right now. So what we're going to do to compute the upper sum is we multiply the volume of each dyadic cube. In this particular case, volume is length. In this particular case, volume is area. In R3, volume is volume. But we multiply the volume of each dyadic cube by the supremum of the function f that we are integrating over that cube and sum over all of the cubes. So what's the greatest function value that this function achieves over this cube. Right here, multiply it by its length. How about the greatest it achieves over this cube? Multiply it by its length. Plus the greatest it achieves over this cube? Multiply it by its length. And so on and so forth. You do this over all the cubes. And for the lower Riemann sum, we take the infimum of the function value over each subinterval or each dyadic cube, and we multiply it by the volume of the dyadic cube. And so what we've created here is an expression for the upper and lower Riemann sums depending on the level of dyadic division. Now, as the level of dyadic division gets higher and higher and higher, right, maybe n equals 4, n equals 8, n equals 12, what's happening is that we are dividing these regions into smaller and smaller dyadic cubes. Our estimation of the integral is getting more and more exact, just like we did in the old univariate way where we were slicing those subintervals more and more finely. And what ends up happening is that we want to look and see what do these upper and lower Riemann sums look like as n goes to infinity. We create sequences of both of these as in u sub 1, u sub 2, u sub 3, u sub 4, making the level of dyadic division get more and more fine, l sub 1, l sub 2, l sub 3, l sub 4. We want to watch as these sequences, as n, that subscript, goes to infinity if that limit is the same between the upper and lower Riemann sums, then that defines the value of the integral over the region A. Now, if the limit's not the same though, then the Riemann integral of the function does not exist. There are a couple issues here, obviously. This is the most important takeaway though, right here. That if the sequences of the upper and lower sums approach the same limit as n goes to infinity, that limit defines the integral of f over the region A. That's very important. When we say something is Riemann integrable, that's what we mean. That over any interval, the upper and lower sums converge to the same limit. Or maybe we say that it's Riemann integrable over a particular interval, and that's what we're saying about that interval. Over that interval, the upper and lower sums converge to the same limit as n goes to infinity. In your proof 14.1, which is a proof that the sum of the integrals is the integral of the sums for two integrable functions. 
we're given as part of the hypothesis that we're working with two integrable functions. If we're told that a function is integrable, that means that its upper and lower sums converge to the same limit. So that's a really important tool for us to use in that first proof that you are required to learn this semester. And of course, as you may have suspected, there are some necessary qualifications for a function to be Riemann integrable. One is that the function must be bounded. Think for a moment about the function 1 over x. If you're trying to use Riemann integration over an interval that includes 0, that is not going to work because the upper and lower sum of some of these subintervals of these dyadic cubes are going to be infinite. So you really need the function to be bounded over your particular region of integration. You also need bounded support. And support means the interval of integration that you're integrating over, essentially. We'll get into a little bit more of the technical understanding behind what the support is in lecture. But essentially, if you have an infinite interval, like from 0 to positive infinity, you would have an infinite number of dyadic cubes to sum over. And that is not part of using Riemann integration. A bit later we will discuss how to deal with infinite series in something called Lebesgue integration, but for Riemann integration you have a finite number of cubes. Note that this is very important that we're able to enclose the region of integration in a set of cubes. You can't use an infinite number of cubes to do that. So for us, for Riemann integrability, you need a bounded function and bounded support, a bounded region of integration. And that's that, as long, the big major takeaways that you need to gather from this particular discussion are exactly the generalization of this old subintervals concept that we used in BC or AB or IB math methods, whatever you're coming from, calculus, to a more systematic, you know, one size fits all approach of dyadic cubes. So understand that process. We'll be doing a couple of examples in class, as well as in group problems and on the homework. The second thing is understanding what it means for a function to be Riemann integrable. That means that their upper and lower sums approach the same limit. And also to prove that something's not Riemann integrable, show that the upper and lower sums do not approach the same limit.